So James, you've had some great news from your lead candidate, MSP 1014. You've had a fast track approval for phase two clinical trials from the MHRA, which is the British version of the FDA. So give us a few more details about this big milestone and what it means for you guys, because this is exciting news. Yeah, it's it's really exciting. You know, the uh, the end goal, as always, is is to try to get uh, you know better medicines to to patients, right? Um, and you have to go through the regulatory process to to do that. And this was uh, really represented like a, a big leap forward for um, you know for mindset because. What, what exactly what happened is that we uh, we filed a, a an application with the MHRA, which is the as you said the UK equivalent of the FDA, um, and we'd been kind of hoping based on uh, some dialogue that they were going to let us um, skip uh, forward into clinical studies and bypass some of what you call like pre IND toxicology. Anyway, it's a lot of words, but bypass a bunch of safety studies because of the similarity of MSB 1014 to psilocybin. But um, once we got into a, a more extensive dialogue with them, actually, um, they were uh, prepared to let us go even further. And they said, so uh, essentially what they said was that we can go uh, directly into phase two clinical trials bypassing phase one. So. For those of you who are not familiar with the clinical trial process, you've probably heard of like phase one, two, three. Essentially phase one, you're, me you're trying to measure the safety of a drug. It's only once you get to phase two that you start, me you start measuring um, the efficacy of the drug, like how well the drug works um, in, in terms of you know, your intended uh, disease that you're trying to treat. So typically, Drugs become really, you know, uh, they, they, they sort of like fall out as you go through the regulatory funnel, but they become, as they pass stages, they become, uh, frankly, you know, more valuable because they're, they're closer to, to getting uh, to patients. So this guidance from the MHRA was huge for us because it meant that um, we can bypass phase one, we can go right into phase two. It means that we're, you know, that much closer to, to getting it to patients and, and I guess, more immediately, that much closer to uh, to getting to start getting like a, a signal around its efficacy in treating depression. So it's a huge it's a huge huge milestone for us, and it really it kind of overnight makes uh, MSP 1014 one of the most advanced uh, clinical stage uh, novel psychedelic drugs. Right, right, exactly. And that's something that we've noticed as well. You've been focused since day one on the initial pharmacology and producing novel drugs. So can you shed some color on your unique approach and then what you believe gives you your edge against other companies in the industry? Yeah, so, so Mindset was started with a really simple idea back in 2019. And, and it was started with this insight that um, we were at a point in time, even then, where there was enough data around the usefulness of psychedelic medicine that um, it was at kind of at this point it was inevitable, and that and that pharma would want to get involved. But that when pharma looks at a drug space, um, although all drugs end up going generic, that's not where big pharma starts. They want to start with drugs that are what you call novel, it just means new, new drugs. Um, where they can enjoy really strong IP rights. And, uh, and, and so that was what we focused on was novel drugs because, um, you know, that in our view, that's where the market ultimately would go. Pharma would look at the data around these like first generation psychedelic drugs like psilocybin and would say to themselves, that looks really good. The, these dr drugs like this can help people. But they would not focus on sort of psilocybin or formulations of psilocybin or of other old drugs. They would look to, to novel drugs. And we felt like there was an opportunity to create a really useful drug discovery company that was focused on essentially taking those you know, drug structures, the known drug structures, and making modifications to them to make them novel and to improve them. And that that would be really valuable to pharma and patients. And to put things in perspective here, MSP 1014 is your most advanced drug to date, but yet it's outside of your partnership with Itsuko. So can you delve further into that and speak about the benefits of having a diverse portfolio of drugs as part of your strategy? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, so in, in our view, when we got started, you know, our scientists saw, you know, huge opportunities to all kinds of different opportunities to try to create, you know, novel drugs. And so we, we didn't, we didn't want to be, you don't, you know, you don't get very far being kind of a one trick pony in, so to speak in, in, you know, in drug discovery. Um, and they really saw an opportunity to kind of create a drug discovery platform that could continually develop a discovery engine that could continually develop, you know, novel drugs, learn from our earlier work, you know, re-input that and kind of just kind of like iterate and iterate new drugs. Um, and, and that's what we've done. And so to date, we've, we've put together probably what is, I, I would guess, the broadest portfolio in, of anyone in, in novel drugs and in sort of psychedelic therapeutics. Part of that portfolio, um, we are collaborating with, as you mentioned, uh, the U.S. development arm of Otsuka. This was the first big pharma collaboration in the space. It's still the only big pharma collaboration on, uh, on novel drugs. And so we have two of our, we call them families. They're sort of like, it, that's an umbrella term for like a, a pretty broad chemical structure. We have two families with them that are moving, you know, really well, not quite as advanced as MSP 1014, but um, moving really, really well. We have a couple of candidates from, um, from our family too that are in IND enabling studies right now, which is sort of the last stop before you file a clinical trial application. So really excited about the progress we're making there too. And speaking about your diverse portfolio, I wanted to take a step back here and just talk about non-hallucinogenic, non-tryptamine compounds or psychedelics without the high. So back in April, you made a filing for those classes of drugs. I believe it was for two patents. Can you briefly take us through that patent filing and then what that means for the larger medical community and for patients as well? Yeah, sure. So, so, so like we were saying, we keep, we keep doing more discovery work. We keep learning more about psychedelic drug structures and how they interact with, with the body uh, and so on. Um, and, and at this point, I'd say mindset has really covered off a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the intellectual property around what you call the tryptamine class of drugs. So psilocybin, DMT, 5-MeO, DMT. On novel analogs of those, we've really covered a lot of that work off. We've got MSB 1014, that's advancing really well. We've got the Otsuka collaboration, that's advancing really well. So the, one of the new areas that we're focused on is um, where there, which is, there's a lot of, there's some promise and kind of early data around this is, um, could we take a, a psychedelic drug structure, make some modifications to it so that it no longer, you know, induced if you took a full dose of it, uh, a full psychedelic experience, but would that still convey some of the same benefits of, uh, of, a, of a true psychedelic therapeutic? And so that, that w w some of the, the patents that we filed just recently, those are around new drug structures that are kind of outside of that tryptamine universe where um, based on sort of some of the initial data, our view is that they're unlikely to induce a full psychedelic experience. Drugs, if we can hit that profile, that opens up really a, a very, very large market because uh, you know there's all kinds of patient groups where you wouldn't want them to undergo a full psychedelic experience. Not everybody is is you know is going to be comfortable with with uh, with a, a big transformative psychedelic experience, and, and it would be probably a, a similar way of, of or a more familiar way of, of taking you know medication or a therapeutic. So I think there are would be lots and lots of opportunities for mindset if we're sort of successful in that work, and also the more that we kind of continue to build out this IP moat around what we have. Um, the more value we create in the company. Right, and that would speak about taking a look and broadening the scope of psychedelics to even psychedelics which may not give you that psychedelic experience, quote unquote. So there's a bit of controversy around that in terms of people looking at psychedelics and the inherent properties they're in that might come from the psychedelic experience. So can you comment on that as well? And contrast between what you're doing and classical psychedelic drugs that give you that hallucinogenic experience. Yeah, I think I think the important thing to keep in mind is that you know a lot of the science around this isn't isn't settled yet. So what what we know or what we're I think what we have a pretty good 
um, sense is that for to get for people who are suffering from treatment resistant depression, major depressive disorder, um, there seems to be really a strong correlation between uh, you know a, a full psychedelic experience and getting um, you know relief from from those depressive symptoms. It's, it seems like you need that big major um you know sort of break or rewiring or mystical experience or what whatever it is that you want to kind of or psychedelic trip whatever it is that you want to call it um but uh but there is some like really interesting earlier uh you know animal data around sort of low doses of uh of, of psychedelic drugs and the potential of low doses to help symptoms of, of, of disease, more symptoms of disease. So, you know, things like, um, things like, uh, you know, low motivation and, and anxiety and so on. So it's our, and again, it's, it's early, but like, it's our guess that there is going to, that, yeah, drugs that, that don't induce the full experience, but have some of the same chemical properties essentially, um, are, 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 you know, potentially going to have, you know, a role to play in, in treating some of these symptoms of, of, uh, of neuropsychiatric diseases. And that speaks to what you've called in the past the march of science in terms of the advancements in psychedelics. And there's been a lot of advancements recently. We've had the FDA issue some guidance in regards to clinical trials. So I wanted to get your perspective on these things as well as you develop beyond classical psychedelics. And if you anticipated things moving so relatively quickly. I, I, I think that... Um things are unfolding really the way that sort of our scientific founders had, had thought they would, but I think in a lot of ways it's happening, you know, even, even faster. And so, you know, um, you know, we thought that pharma would be ultimately be interested in the space. We didn't expect to form a, a big pharma, you know, collaboration, you know, so soon. I don't think we could have expected that, you know, we'd be sitting here today and, and, and there would be, you know, professional athlete after athlete after celebrity, you know, coming out of the woodworks, you know, talking about their, uh, their uh, embrace of, of, you know, the use of psychedelics drugs in their personal lives. The, the FDA guidance is, I think, a fantastic indication of the importance that the FDA is placing on the innovation and potential that psychedelic medicine, you know, represents. And so yeah, I think, you know, we've probably talked about before, the FDA is given the psilocybin and MDMA trials, breakthrough therapy status. This is a whole other next level of acceptance though, coming out with these, you know, guidelines where, and if you read them, they're really thinking carefully about what it is that they want companies to address to drug developers to address in their trial design and the issues they want them to address and they're not doing this the tone of it is is really i think really quite telling it's it's not a, the tone of it's not like a restrictive tone it's it's much more it's much more written from the standpoint of you know we want we want you to be successful in your development efforts and here are the issues that we want you to try to deal with in your application and in your trial design. So it, it's, it's really, you know, quite a strong endorsement um, uh, and, and, and sort of validation of, of the work, all the work that's kind of come before and the work that's pushing, you know, psychedelic drugs forward. So I, I think it's like hugely exciting. Right, and we're seeing a lot of the development here, which is really unheard of, especially within the biotech industry. We definitely want to thank you for joining us today, James. Those were some fantastic responses to our questions. Thanks again. Thanks so much, Dwayne. Uh, great, to, great to chat anytime.